My name is Nana Koji Oku Asari Okuku Yuenchi. I am a student of Ghana Christian International High School. You are welcome to the Dream Big Series Season 2, an exciting program that takes children to explore our world with special people who have contributed greatly to the growth of our society. Today, we are going to meet the president of the Ghana Technology University College and the chief of Petransan in the Asante region. He is Nana Dr. Osei Dakwa III. Come, let's meet him. Who are your parents and where were you born? Davis Dakwa is the name of my father. He passed about seven years ago. Uh, Alice Dakwa, the name of my mom, she passed about four years ago. I was born at a small community called Patrensa in the Ashanti Achim district of the Ashanti region of Ghana. <laughs> Growing up in Patrensa, how was that like? Patrensa is a village and in most communities, rural communities in this country, the main occupation is farming. You know, about 55 years ago, we had challenges there. There was no power, there was no electricity. So we used the lantern. Water was a challenge. We used stream water, you know, to drink, to bathe and all that. Of course, the world has changed a lot. Um, and I think that experience really inspired us to grow up, to change the lifestyle of our people. As a child, what did you dream about and have any of those dreams led you here? I was inspired to go to school. Uh, farming is hard. Farming is great. But I didn't want to farm. I wanted to go to school to acquire the highest degree possible. My dad was a police officer, so, you know, he was moving around a lot. I followed him. So uh, I decided that I would go to school. And that's exactly what I did. Those days, there was something we call common entrance. Start for the common examination, passed, went to secondary school. Today, they call it senior high school. I uh, went to sixth form, you know, today there's no sixth form. And then entered the university, University of Ghana, for my first degree, and then continued, left the shores of this country to acquire the highest degree possible. Now, the degree is one thing, and what you do with it, you know, is another. What's the purpose of acquiring a degree? It's not working at the end of the month to get a paycheck, but using the degree to make an impact in the lives of people who may not be able to have that opportunity. When you went to school, what did you study? Well, initially I studied uh, so sociology because I was interested in people and society. But in the course of my study, that was when the <coughs> information revolution uh, was emerging. So when I left the shores of this country, I went to Norway. I went to study in Norway. And then I was exposed to computers and computer systems. Uh, so when I left Norway, I went to the United States. Uh, and there I decided that even though my former degree was still in the social sciences, but then I had a passion, you know, to learn about computers. So somewhere along the line, I enrolled in you know all kinds of computer courses, to courses in computer hardware, networking, uh, website development, name it. You are responsible for turning the Ghana Telecom Institute of about 100 students into the Ghana Technology University College of over 6,000 students. How did you do this? Well, you know, it, it wasn't easy. When I came here, there was no university. I started from scratch laid all the structures to really build a modern day university. Now, every university, you know, there are structures, uh, physical infrastructure, technological infrastructure, and your human resource. We have to hire people we believe could help us achieve this dream. You know, so I hire people who have been working with me, and then they have really helped to translate my vision into reality. You need trusted people, you need loyal people, you need people who you can call around the clock and they will be not be motivated by money, by the passion for what they do. And that is how we've been able to transform this institution from a training center 
to a university college which is ranked the best private university in Ghana today and the four best in the country. Under your leadership, what are some of the awards that GTUC has won? Well, we've won several awards. Um, we once won the award as the best telecommunication university in Africa, got the Le Martini Award uh, that was given to us in Mauritius. We have the European Business Association Award for the best innovative university. We have another award as the best IT university. I think we've won over 10 awards over the past uh, five years, you know, also. You are president of this university college mm -hmm. and a chief of Petrensa. Yeah. How do you combine these two tasks? Being a president and being a chief, which is a traditional ruler, yes, there are different roles. Uh, and it has not been easy. Because when I travel to my community, I deal with different issues. You deal with people. You know, they have issues around land, they have issues around uh, marriages, issues around development, I mean, name it. But when I come here, the issues are different. And you also deal with differences of people at different levels. This is an IT-oriented school. We use technology for most of the things that we do. Uh, in our classroom, we use technology. I've created a similar environment at the village where we have boardroom with all the cages that you can think of. Uh, here we use um, all kinds of systems, you know, to bring our people together. Mailing lists, you know, for example, which has replaced the old memos. I've done similar at the village using a WhatsApp group to unite all the people in the community regardless of location because it's about development. And using the technology to bring the two roles together has really, really helped in a lot. But any time I'm here at the university, I have to know that I'm dealing with different sets of issues. And then when I go to the village, because our issues are different, but through technology, I've been able to more or less bridge that gap in leadership. As the chief of Patreon, sir, how have you influenced the village? Being a chief, you know, you have privileges and you have responsibility and you have authority. How do you bring all of this, you know, together? Being a chief is about the welfare and development of your people. You know, they have needs and then you have resources. So how do you use the resources to uplift their socioeconomic standing? Since becoming a chief, I have tried to unite all the people, regardless of whether they live there or outside, again, through technology. We have databases, we have mailing lists, uh, we've created platforms on the internet, uh, there's a channel on YouTube, you know, this is new. We've created a local antenna for the people. So anytime there's a major event, it is played, it is learned throughout the school system. I've given them a strategic plan. The strategic plan is a main vision for the community over the next 10 years, over the next 20 years. What are we going to do? You know, to transform the educational system at the village, to transform the healthcare system at the village, to transform the land tenure system at the village because this is a farming you know, community and issues around land are very, very delicate. We need to improve upon agriculture. This is a farming community again. The way they farm, they used to walk to their farms. But today, I've been able to widen the footpaths and they become more traveled. So they know, yes, some people say walk, but they have available transportation. So they can ride to the farms. They don't have to headload the food items. They can put them in these vehicles. Uh, we have rest stops on the way, you know, because sometimes it rains and there are other natural hazards. So they can rest, you know. So this has really revolutionized because the way we farm today is still small farm holdings. It's still peasant farming. It's not really going to break the cycle of poverty. The goal is to transform farming so that it becomes mechanized. We use machinery. You know, with that, it can increase the farm holdings. Uh, crop yield could be increased. You know, income will also be increased so that the farmers can take their kids, you know, to school. 
and it will be able to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty. This is like a 20-year plan which is being implemented, you know, step by step. So every year we focus on an aspect of the strategic plan. Every week you write columns in the Ghanaian Times newspaper. What do you write about? You see, society has come far over the years. At one point, it was the agricultural society, so the focus was on agriculture. Then we moved to a new stage, the industrial age. The focus became on industrialization and all that. Today is the information age. You know, I look at the history of societal development, and I always say that in a society who is not able to use the tools of the age will be relegated to the dustbin of history. Now, what do I mean by this? This is information age. So if we let the information age bypass us, and we are not able to take advantage, then we'll be stuck. We will not be able to progress as a nation. That is why countries like China, countries like uh, South Korea, uh, Estonia, they have been so successful because they are using the tools of the age, which is information technology. So how can we use technology to advance our socioeconomic development? That is what I write about. How can we apply technology to our educational system? Uh, we go to class, we go to school, it's face to face, right? But today, because of technology, you can take online courses, what we call virtual education. You don't have to go to a four-wall classroom at all. So how can we as a country use that technology to upgrade or develop a supplementary kind of educational system that will give people the opportunity that is more flexible, that is turned towards workforce development, where people can have access to education. How can we use technology when it comes to trade and commerce? Uh, we still go to the market to buy stuff, we go to the supermarket, but you can go online and order your, your groceries, you know, through the internet and it to be delivered at home. Okay, so you can take each of the, what we call, social institutions. The social institutions are what we call the building block of society. And when we say social institution, uh, we refer to the political institution, we refer to the family institution, we refer to the religious institution, we refer to educational, the economic institution. These are dominant societal institutions. So we can apply technology to each of these institutions. So that is what I have been writing about over the past six years. How and where do you find inspiration? God inspires us. There's always a higher being. We trust and we have faith and confidence that whatever aspiration that we have, He will guide us to get to that level. You know, I have four daughters, and especially the junior ones, they're always studying. You know, we always communicate, you know, all the time. And they challenge me also. You know, recently I told one of my daughters, you know, I'm chief, I'm present, and you say, is that all? You know, it means there's more that I can do. So you're always inspired to do, you know, something more. But for me, I know my kids, and also the impact of what I have done. Because, you know, for example, anytime I go to the bank, somebody comes, he takes my checkbook, cash my money for me. And then I say, why? Well, I say, oh, you know, I was a student at your school. You know, so at least tells you that you're doing something good. It inspires you, you know, to do more. What books do you read and why? Most of them are technology related because they are so fascinating at what they can do. You know, we say we live in a global village now. Why is it possible? Because of the impact of technology. 
I mean, those days when we were growing up, we would have to write letters, go to the post office and all that. Today we still have the post office, but the rule have changed. Because technology allows us to do the same thing in a different and a better way. You know, some people have been able to put man on the moon. They're bringing a lot of research transforming society. And I know they are even trying to explore space tourism, right? So tomorrow, who knows what the technology will allow us to do. But science and technology has really changed the world. In your life, who has influenced you the most? I would say maybe my mom. Um, you see, my mom was born just one. Uh, she had no brothers, she has no sisters. Uh, and her mom, my, that's my grandmother, died early. And I remember that day very well. Uh, and my mom told us a story that uh, she was laying down, I think on the day of the funeral, of course, you'll be sad if you are the only child and your mom passes at a very early age. And that she saw her mom as if she was awake, as if she was um, sleeping, appear to her and said, you shouldn't worry. You should just take care of her kids and let the kids will take care of her. And she had no challenge, you know, in life. My mom told us a story. So how do we ensure that whatever, call it vision or call it visitation, will materialize? You know, and for me, the only outcome and option is education. Because I know it levels, education levels the playing field. It doesn't matter whether you come from a poor home, or a rich home, a village, or an urban environment. If you acquire degrees, it's the same. Nobody will say, we're not going to give it to you because of your background. So she really, really inspired us. And then my grandfather, uh, who is still living though, yeah, who will be soon, will be 103 years old. He tells us great stories. In my life. Sometimes you say in 1930, you know, and he said 1930, and this is 20-something, you know, and she remembers almost everything. And he tells us about his lifestyle and the secret of his longevity. So it gives us hope and inspiration. And today I visit him very often, anytime I have the time, just to listen to stories. Africa will have this oral tradition culture. So most of these facts, we don't write it. So now I am trying to record, you know, some of the things that he tells us so that we can document it for posterity. Growing up, what name were you called by and has it changed? I know in secondary school, uh, there's a type of mathematics that we call integer. And I think I was very, very good at that, you know, deals with numbers and all that. So, you know, some of my classmates used to call me that. But I think after school, you know, I can't even trace where most of them are. You know, it kind of vanish. Other than that, I think I've really maintained my, my name. And actually, at the university, I think my surname was, was a little hidden. You know, most people who knew me used to call me. Uh, I was born on Friday, so that is Kofi. And then my name is Ose, so they used to call me Ose Kofi. And that was a name until I think I entered the university when there was more focus on my surname. You know, but it hasn't really changed, you know, today because I'm chief, you know, and my name really never changed. You know, it's only there's a Nana in front and there's a third behind. So it's Nana Ose Dakwa, the third. You know, in my private life, is or said that quite so. You know, no significant change in them. According to UNICEF, one out of four children in Ghana are poor. What are your thoughts on this, and what steps can we take? Poverty is a challenge. Uh, it's a global issue. It's not only a Ghanaian issue. And I know child poverty is also a challenge because for kids who are growing up in poor environments, you know, their future is hijacked. You know, we are not able to unlace their hidden, you know, talents. 
So we need to do more of our poverty. And I know we can institutionalize measures that will turn or that can turn the page on poverty. <laughs> How can we do that? Um, one is education. I know there's a high dropout rate, especially in the rural environment, because of resources and sometimes lack of vision, you know, as well. Now, if we are able to put in place policies and measures to ensure that all kids are in school, because I believe that every bad deserves a chance to bloom. That is one approach. Uh, skill development at an early age. You go to countries like India, they have the Barefoot College. You don't need any formal education to enter that institution. You know, so we I always say that you can study with your head or with your hands. Some people are gifted. They can go to school to the highest level, you know, because um, they can deal with all the challenges. Others are not, but they can do great stuff with their hands. So why we need what I call a trade school. If you go to Germany, that is a no. They have trade schools, you know, plumbers. Look at the guys at Kokompe and Swami and all that. They can do great things. They can make carburetors out of coconut. They've never been to school. They use their hands. So we need to institutionalize or set up trade schools that would help kids. We also need to build confidence. You know, there's this dependency mindset among most people. People feel that somebody will have to hold their hands and that they cannot lift themselves by their own bootstrap. It's a mindset issue and we need to change that. If you know that you can do it, the propensity to succeed and to make it. Yes, everybody needs a push, you know, but you have to instill that in you, that you will make it. If we are able to put all these things in place, we'll be able to minimize poverty, especially poverty among kids, and society will be a better place for all of us. Can you tell us a story which has made an impact on you? When I was a student at the University of Oslo uh, in Norway, this is way back, and then I know we're given an assignment. And those days, there was something we called the floppy disket. And then the lecturer said, assignment is on the disket. And that was the first time I held a disket. And then he said, to assess the assignment, you know, you need to go to a computer lab and then, you know, print it out or view it. Uh, I didn't know how to do it. Uh, and I had some Chinese friends. So I, you know, conferred with them. How do I retrieve this assignment? They started laughing at me. Uh, you know, these Chinese, they grew up with these gadgets. So we went to the lab and the friends, Chinese, they helped me to assess the information. You know, and I said, this small disk, we can hold volumes of pages this is a powerful technology. So we really need to be exposed to how it works. Because over there, all the assignments were on diskettes. Those days there were no pen drives and stuff like that. You know, how can we use this tool, apply this tool to our development? So that was where my interest in computers started. So I made it my declared policy to get to know how the technology works. So for me, that is what we call a game changer. And that really, really made a big difference in what I do today. Thank you, Nana Dr. Osei Dakwa, for explaining to us the importance of technology, education, teamwork, determination, and hard work. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for asking me all the brilliant questions. I really enjoyed this interview with you. Thanks a lot. Well, viewers, 
These are the fruits of one's labor. I hope this inspires us to work hard and one day we might have our own stories to tell. Once again, this is Nana Kojo Asaro Kukirinji. Thank you for watching the Dream Big Series Season 2. Goodbye.